Well, I know that talking about engaging with legislators is super important in DC and here in Austin, it's just as important. Um, you know, Texas Normal has been really kind of thinking what does virtual advocacy look like? You know, curious as to what will we be able to attain in the 87th legislature and what will it look like in the Texas legislature at all? Um, you know, how will we be engaging with legislators at that point? And so I'm excited that we get to have Representative Joe Moody from House District 78 out in the El Paso area with us. He's an attorney, a former prosecutor, and he was elected at age 27, making him the youngest. Texas. So we just had the youngest ED, and now we have the youngest state representative. Um, he's done a lot to really push the conversation around criminal justice reform and marijuana law up at the Capitol. And he's joining us today to talk a little bit about what his goals are. So I'm going to unmute you, representative, and I'm going to spotlight your video so everyone can see you. Awesome. Hello. Hey, Thank you for joining you? us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Awesome, thanks. So I was just gonna turn it over to you to kind of talk about some of your goals and what you wanna accomplish. Sure, well, um, you know, first of all, thanks for everybody for doing this, obviously a little bit different than probably envisioned. Um, and, and hopefully everybody uh, in their own way, I mean, obviously this, this, this situation is impacting everybody in a very different way, but I want to um, uh, certainly, um, certainly wanna, you know, Hope for the best and send my you know, send my best to everybody because no matter how they're encountering this pandemic, you know I hope that they're able to to live their life as um, you know as happily as they can for the time being, um, and and hopefully they're you know taking care of themselves, taking care of those around them the best they can. I know it's not not an easy situation, um, so certainly certainly um, that sits over everything that we're talking about today. Um, but I wanted to do want to focus on where we might be going uh, in 2021 with cannabis legislation and maybe a little bit of recap about where we've been. Um, um, but, uh, um, but actually coming up, pivoting off of the last speaker, I think it's pretty important to talk about how we can always uh, demand more of uh, those that represent us, right? And so um, I, I came to this issue because of a constituent. Um, because of El Paso Normal and 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 because of Colt and his his crew here, so I want to say hi to them. They're doing great advocacy here in El Paso. They're there at City Hall, um, and in fact, even in during these times, they've been virtually appearing at City Hall or, or making sure that their voice is is heard on this on site and release policies and things alike. So um, that advocacy is really important. So um, you know, I came into this discussion looking at a broken criminal justice system that was wasteful, was hypocritical. Um, it was a system that, that it made us less safe, um, hurts people that weren't hurting anyone else, and, and a system that was very expensive, right? And, and, and spending a ton of money without returning much uh, in that transaction. And, and, and I started with decriminalization. I had been carrying the decriminalization bill or civil sanction bill in Texas since 2015, began working on it before session in 2014. Um, and, began with that effort mainly because right there's a lot of avenues we can take we can do nothing status quo we can look at decriminalization we can look at medical we can look at retail and in the makeup of the texas legislature we thought that the decriminalization avenue was um was and, and probably would still be uh, the the best step and the most sure step that we could take and, and it would be a big step in terms of policy here uh, here in texas but we've come a long way in the first session uh, that we had this in 2015. It's a very, uh, very tough to even get a vote in committee. Um, we did get a vote, positive vote, but that was about it. The next session in 2017, the bill was voted out much earlier uh, in session, uh, but we weren't ultimately able to get um, the full house to vote on the bill. And then last session in 2019, we got it to the house floor and actually got a super majority of members to vote for it. And so for those of you who don't follow the Texas legislature, there's 150 members in the House, and a supermajority means we had over 100 votes for that bill, which means it had broad bipartisan support, um, and that was really a uh, really a great moment for the movement. Um, and it's uh, it's that progress that we made because of work, uh, like work done by people that are watching this live stream and the people that aren't able to join us today. That's why we got it that far. Um, we certainly hit a roadblock when the bill went over to the Senate, um, but I haven't quit working on those issues. 
And I think I'm pretty optimistic uh, that we'll be able to work out those issues going into next session. Um, now, if we were having this conversation three months ago, um, you know, I'd probably be telling you how good things look for decriminalization and uh, the different avenues we were, uh, you know, treading down in, in, in that discussion. Um, but that kind of thinking is, is, uh, is pre-coronavirus. And so we have a new reality, uh, one that's gonna bring new challenges and is gonna require new solutions. And so, you know, I think the challenges we face in the wake of, of the coronavirus are, are threefold. One is money, right, funding dollars. And that's, that is pretty straightforward. And not only the coronavirus that's hit, hitting our, 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 our budget here in Texas, but if you notice today, oil is trading under $5 a barrel. And for Texas economy, for Texas budget, that is uh, building an even larger hole uh, for us to dig out of. And so prior to this, you know, we were thinking about, um, you know, a pretty healthy budget. Um, and even with that healthy budget, we are concerned about our dedication of funds into public education, um, wanting to look at shoring up infrastructure, wanting to look up, you know, at shoring up higher education. And that was in the environment where we thought we were going to have a healthy looking budget. Now, instead of that, we're looking at a pretty deep um, and unprecedented cash crunch next session. And so, you know, I'd like to give you an estimate of what that, what that would look like. I can't even begin to because I don't know where we're going to land. I can tell you that even if things tomorrow turned around and went well from now until next year, we are still looking at, at unprecedented uh, holes in the budget on numerous fronts. And, and that's something that we're going to have to have to look at, right? So challenge of, challenge of money, um, challenge of distance, right? We need more distance. We have an immediate need to reduce jail and prison populations. Uh, we have an immediate need to reduce uh, contact between law enforcement and Texans to keep both populations safe. Um, in fact, during this time, we've seen many local jurisdictions that are you know, looking the other way on low grade possession. And surprisingly, the sky hasn't, hasn't fallen. Uh, it's a very natural experiment that proves what we've all known for a long time, which is that personal use of cannabis is not a public safety concern in any shape, uh, in, in any way, shape or form. Um, and then we've got, to, we've got to think about broadly the legal system as a whole and that the, the, the virus presents us a, um, and kind of compounds and exposes the issue of an overburdened legal system. Right. If we want to do a better job uh, of meeting future crises, uh, we want to make sure that we're focused on priorities, um, you know, on real criminal justice priorities. And we need fewer people in our jails and our courts permanently. That's something that we need to reevaluate on a permanent basis. And, and the third issue that we, that we have to look at this, uh, you know, kind of look at post coronavirus is, is the issue of liberty. Right. And so while arrests are down, uh, rights are being threatened in brand new ways. And it's, it's the expansion and consolidation of power that we often see when uh, emergencies uh, come on the scene. So we need to make sure that we restore and protect our constitutional rights. Um, and one way we can do that is to have fewer laws that don't make us, uh, don't make us any safer or more prosperous. And I apologize. I still have to, I'm still reporting to work. So what you're hearing is my work phone in the background, but um, it'll go away in a second. Anyway. When we talk about liberty, we need to look at uh, reforming criminal laws, looking at market regulation, and looking at the security and person uh, security of our own persons and our property. Right? I now believe that a a full on retail market for cannabis is the solution, and look at it through those three categories we just discussed: the money issue. You know, I've been advocating for a long time to to decriminalize, and because just on that front, we would say. Uh, on arrest and prosecution, almost three quarters of a billion dollars every year. If we actually bring a retail market into play in Texas, those additional funds can go directly to crucial state priorities. You can, because it'd be a new construct, you can look at how to tie it to education, how to tie it to first responders, those in the healthcare field that are, that are helping us confront this issue. Um, you know, we can look at them as, you know, look at those funds that you were able to raise in a, you know, in a way that makes them like a, stimulus package of its own kind here in Texas. Uh, and the new industry alone will provide a powerful economic boost to the state of Texas. And that's something that we're gonna desperately need as I've already described our shortage going into next session. Let's talk about the distance issue, right? Um, a retail market uh, immediately reduces 
uh, the amount of contact we're going to have between law enforcement and the public, right? Because now you've got a, a, legal, a legal path uh, to obtain cannabis. It also reduces the strain that we're going to have on the legal system. We talked about permanently trying to reduce the number of people that we're injecting into the legal system. Uh, and so we can do that by creating a legal retail market. Uh, we can reduce the burden on the legal system. Um, best of all, it puts our focus in the criminal justice system on the things that actually matter, right? Things that where people are hurt uh, and, and not that are, you know, things that actually would address our safety and security. Um, and then if we want to talk, then we talk about that third kind of lane of, of, of issues, which is liberty, right? We're seeing, we're seeing a move now generally to lock up more people for longer times. And, and that's really the, the wrong path for us to take. And so we need to start moving away from that uh, immediately and, and decisively. This gives us that opportunity. The retail market can be uh, a step away from excessive searches, uh, abusive asset forfeiture, and, and other government overreach uh, that's tied to cannabis. Um, you know, and I don't, I don't, you know, I don't need to tell you that um, that we need a a free and open market instead of uh, a government stranglehold. We know this because we've seen. With the, um, with the passage of the Compassionate Use Act, we have a too, nar too narrow, too strict, too overregulated medical industry. So we need to advance something that actually creates a, a, a free and open market uh, that makes sense in a regulatory, that makes, has, a, has a, um, a sensible regulatory scheme over the top of it. Um, now, I, I think is, it, you know as well as I do that any change in this policy, cannabis policy in general, is is not a done deal. It's very difficult to get these things done. Um, but knowing that a retail market would be difficult, I think, it, you know, if we didn't take this opportunity to try this, I think that we wouldn't be doing our job. Uh, I think we'd be, you know, we'd essentially be bargaining against ourselves if we didn't take a shot at this. And so I think it's an opportunity to, to discuss this policy more broadly because of the different things that we have to confront going forward after the coronavirus. Um, you know, we have to push for good government and smart policies. And this, this fits in so many different categories uh, that we need to discuss and I think we'll be ready to discuss uh, going forward. That being said, you've seen the struggle and how long it's taken to take things like decriminalization to the point where you've got 100 members voting for it on the House floor. This is not gonna be a small task. And so we're gonna definitely need each and every one of you to continue to advocate for that. Um, my office and, and, and our cannabis advocates across the state, including Texas Normal, have started working on what would look like an ideal retail market bill for here in Texas. Um, hope to be reporting some of that research to you in the coming weeks and months as we head into session. Uh, and it's um, then call on you for your advocacy. Um, the way that we advocate may change a little bit uh, given some of the distance that we have to keep between one another, but I think that um, I think the passion is something that you can't uh, you can't certainly can't stifle, and there's there's an opportunity for us to do some very good work, um, and I'm proud to um, to bring that uh, concept to the legislature, particularly coming from El Paso, where prohibition began. I'd love to be um, leading the charge to end prohibition from this beautiful community. So, with that being said, I am. Certainly um, take any questions if there are any, um, but if not, look forward to continue to work with this organization uh, and others across the state of Texas to promote smart and sensible policies. Well, of course, we appreciate all of the work that you've done. You've really, um, when it comes to putting in the legwork as a legislator, uh, you definitely have made me believe that there are a lot of really great legislators out there just trying to do the right thing and working really, really hard for the people that they represent. So I want to thank you for that. And of course, in the stream comments, everybody is giving you love and saying hello. Mm -hmm. But there is just two quick things um, that I wanted to um, get your thoughts on real quick. One of the patients, I know this is a little different from the criminal justice uh, angle that we were talking about, but they were wondering if um, you think it's possible for reciprocity for patients, so patients from another medical state being recognized inside of Texas. Do you think that that's something that might be possible in the next legislative session? So on the medical front, I think we should explore a lot of different options. One of the things we could do, and I've advocated for prosecutors to do this now, is if they have someone with a, they should make it a policy today now that 
if they have someone with a uh, with a prescription, a recommendation from another jurisdiction, and they are legally they would be legally possessing in another state under those rules, they should have a blanket policy that we're not going to prosecute them. Uh, you have you have um, some pretty progressive district attorneys across the state of Texas. I would hope that they would take that policy. So if you're in one of those areas, uh, advocate for that immediately because that can be done without the legislature taking action. Um, but the legislature should look at reciprocity. The legislature should also look at expanding the medical program uh, as a whole. And I know that Representative Eddie Lucio III um, down in South Texas in the Rio Grande Valley has, has been a big advocate and is going to continue to advance those as well. Uh, and we can't, it, it, just because you were looking at um, decrim versus retail doesn't mean you can't stop pushing on the medical side as well. And we should do those things. Absolutely. And then just real quick, um, before we go on to our first musical act, which is Matt Giles, I wanted to also ask you a couple of different people were talking about, you know, Texas normal, we work all over the political spectrum. So, you know, how do you see um, you moving forward with your plans in a bipartisan way over the next um, several months leading up to the legislature? Uh, the beauty about this subject matter, and when I was working on the criminal justice side of things, Criminal justice reform is not one that is, is partisan. Um, you know, we just formed the, the bipartisan criminal justice reform caucus, which is made up of, um, you know, equal number of Republicans and Democrats, people from all different, you know, lanes, even within those parties, those, the, the, you know, the party system. So I don't, I, I don't anticipate that to, to be any different than the, than the kind of, you know, mode of attack on a retail market as well. I mean, we're talking about some pretty basic issues about personal responsibility and liberty and making sure that we're uh, you know, a smart, efficient government. And so I think those things lend themselves to a lot of different discussions uh, on, on the conservative side of the aisle. And, and you know, I think that there are certain, you know, certainly ways that we can continue to develop um, you know, smarter policies on this because we can, we can stay principled, right? We don't want collateral consequences for people that get um, you get arrested at 17 years old because in, in Texas, you're 17 years old, you're an adult for criminal justice purposes. And so uh, people in the business community know that they don't want to just they don't want to uh, over criminalize the workforce here in Texas. So there's there's a myriad of ways that we can connect people on this issue. And so I think that the policy arena itself lends itself to bipartisanship and it's proven that over time. And I don't expect that to change anytime soon. Yeah, you were a great example of that with HB 63, making sure that you had, you know, bipartisan support, you know, bipartisan supermajority out of the House. And so hopefully with our virtual advocacy, we can help grease the way into the Senate and get uh, more done over the next session. So I just want to say thank you so much for joining us. Sure, thank you very much. Awesome. Well, we'll see you again soon.